Welcome to the HFY Tales channel. Remember to like and subscribe if you like the story. Enjoy and take care. The explosion tore through the hull, sending the ship spiraling out of control. Ethan groaned as the force slammed him into the wall, his vision flickering as sparks flew overhead. The alarms blared in his ears, and the emergency lights bathed the cramped cockpit in a harsh, red glow. Everything was shaking. The once moved voyage transformed into chaos. Grabbing the control panel, Ethan tried to regain control, but it was no use. The ship had been hit by an unseen anomaly, a sudden burst of energy that had crippled their navigation systems. They were drifting, pulled into the gravity well of an uncharted planet. Mayday, mayday! Ethan's voice echoed in the emptiness of the cockpit. This is Ethan Clark of the Voyager 7. We're going down. Static was the only response. He was alone. His crew, his friends, they were gone. Ripped from the ship during the explosion, Ethan barely had time to process their loss before the ground rushed up to meet him. The crash was violent, a jarring impact that knocked the breath from his lungs. The sound of metal screeching against rock was deafening, and everything went black. When he awoke, the world was silent, save for the faint crackling of small fires around the wreckage. Ethan's body ached all over, but he was alive. He forced himself to sit up, grimacing at the pain that flared in his ribs. His ship, what was left of it, lay scattered across a field of strange, purple-tinged grass. Alien trees with thick, twisted trunks loomed overhead, their leaves casting long, jagged shadows in the dying light of the planet's twin suns. Ethan staggered to his feet his hand instinctively reaching for the pistol strapped to his thigh. It was a standard issue, barely enough to protect him against the dangers of deep space, let alone the unknown horrors of this planet. But it was better than nothing. All right, Clark, he muttered to himself, trying to shake off the lingering disorientation. Survival mode. Find shelter, find water. Figure out where the hell you are. The planet was unfamiliar the air thick with humidity and the scent of something sweet but decaying. In the distance, he could see towering mountains and dense forests, their alien flora glowing faintly in the twilight. But beyond that, there was nothing. No signs of life. No rescue. Ethan's heart sank as the reality of his situation settled in. He was stranded, alone on a world that wasn't even mapped. Suddenly, a rustling in the bushes nearby caught his attention. His hand tightened on his pistol as his senses went into overdrive. The rustling grew louder, closer. His mind raced. Was it some kind of wild animal? Something dangerous? The leaves parted, and a figure stepped into view. It wasn't an animal. It was a woman. Or at least it resembled one. Tall, muscular, with skin the color of the forest leaves and eyes glowing faintly in the dim light. She was dressed in what appeared to be tribal armor her sharp features painted with symbols that Ethan couldn't comprehend. Her gaze locked onto him, intense and unblinking, as if she were sizing him up. Ethan froze, unsure of what to do. His instinct was to raise the gun, but something in the way she moved made him hesitate. She wasn't attacking. Not yet. More figures appeared behind her, similarly adorned, similarly alien. They surrounded him, their weapons drawn but not yet pointed. Their leader. The first woman spoke, her voice low and guttural, in a language he couldn't understand. Ethan's heart pounded in his chest as he realized one undeniable fact. He wasn't alone anymore. Ethan stood still, every muscle tensed, as the alien women encircled him. Their strange, tribal armor glinted in the dim light, made from materials he couldn't identify, perhaps bones or hardened scales. Each woman carried a weapon, spears, knives, and some kind of curved blade. Their leader, the tall woman with piercing green eyes, was clearly in charge. She said something again, the harsh syllables of her alien tongue making no sense to Ethan. He didn't dare move, raising his hand slowly. He showed them his pistol, making sure to point it toward the ground. He didn't want to provoke them. The leader narrowed her eyes, stepping closer. Her gaze shifted from the gun to his face, as if trying to determine his intentions. Her brow furrowed slightly, and she barked something to the others. Two of the women approached him cautiously, their spears angled toward his chest. 
Ethan could feel the tension crackling in the air. One wrong move, and this could turn deadly. I don't understand you, he said slowly, lowering his voice to sound as non-threatening as possible. I'm not here to hurt you. The leader's eyes flashed with recognition at his tone, but she didn't respond. Instead, she gestured toward his pistol. One of the women stepped forward, motioning for him to hand it over. Reluctantly, Ethan released the weapon and gave it to her. She examined it curiously, but after a brief moment, she tossed it to the ground as if it were of no use to her. The leader waved her hand, and two more women grabbed Ethan's arms. Wait! Ethan tried to pull back, but their grip was ironclad. They began dragging him deeper into the forest, toward the towering trees that loomed like silent giants. Ethan struggled to keep his footing, but it was clear he wasn't going anywhere by his own choice. He was being taken. The dense vegetation swallowed them up, the light from the twin suns growing fainter as they traveled. Ethan's mind raced. He had no idea what these women wanted from him, but he knew enough about survival to stay calm and wait for an opportunity. If he was going to get out of this alive, he needed to play along for now. The alien village was unlike anything Ethan had ever seen. Built into the trees themselves, it was a sprawling network of wooden platforms and bridges, connected by thick vines and ladders. Huts of woven leaves and animal hides dotted the treetops, and there were fires burning in stone pits, casting an eerie glow over the settlement. The air was filled with the sounds of unfamiliar animals and the constant rustle of leaves. As they dragged Ethan into the heart of the village, he noticed dozens of other women watching from the trees. All of them were tall, muscular, and fierce-looking, their eyes glowing faintly in the darkness. They whispered among themselves, pointing at him with curious glances. Ethan felt like he was being examined, scrutinized. The leader finally stopped in front of a large, ornate hut that sat higher than the others. She barked an order, and the women released Ethan, though they stayed close, weapons still in hand. The leader motioned for him to enter the hut. Ethan hesitated. This could easily be a trap, but there was no turning back now. Inside, the air was warm and fragrant with the scent of burning herbs. The space was dimly lit by a few candles, and at the far end of the room sat an imposing figure, the tribe's chief. She was even taller than the others, her skin a deeper shade of green, and her armor was adorned with feathers and bones that marked her status. Her face was stern, her gaze sharp as she assessed Ethan. The leader spoke rapidly to the chief, explaining what had happened. The chief listened intently, her eyes never leaving Ethan. Then the chief spoke. Human. Her voice was deep, rough, but the word was unmistakable. It was the first word Ethan had understood since he landed on this planet. She could speak his language, or at least a version of it. Ethan's heart raced. This was his chance to communicate. I, I mean no harm, Ethan said, his voice steady despite the fear gnawing at him. I crashed here. My ship. It's destroyed. I'm stranded. The chief tilted her head slightly, studying him. Then she leaned forward, her expression hardening. You will serve. Or die, she said bluntly. This is the law. Ethan swallowed hard, his mind spinning. Serve or die. What did that mean? His instinct screamed at him to fight to run, but there was no escape. He was surrounded, outnumbered, and far from anything resembling safety. The chief continued, her voice unwavering. We have waited, long for one like you. You will protect us. You will fight, or you will be killed. Ethan clenched his fists. There was no mistaking the gravity of her words. He was being given a choice. Serve this tribe of alien women, or be executed. And there didn't seem to be a third option. Ethan stood frozen, the weight of the chief's words sinking in. Serve or die. The choice wasn't really a choice at all, and the grim reality of his situation became clearer with every passing second. He could feel the eyes of the other women on him, waiting for his response, their weapons glinting in the low light of the room. Taking a deep breath, he glanced up at the chief, whose gaze was unwavering, commanding. Her authority was absolute here. There was no bargaining, no room for negotiation. But what did serve mean in this alien culture? He had no idea what would be expected of him. I'll serve, 
Ethan finally said, his voice firm but controlled. He wasn't sure what he was agreeing to, but it was better than the alternative. If he had any hope of surviving, he would need to play along, at least until he could figure out more about this strange tribe and its customs. The chief's lips curved into a small, satisfied smile, and she nodded slowly. Good, she said, her tone now less severe. You will serve the tribe, and we will not kill you. With a flick of her wrist, she signaled to the warrior who had captured Ethan. The tall woman, whom he had first seen in the forest, stepped forward, her expression still guarded but less hostile now. She spoke in her own language, though her voice carried a tone of finality. Then she pointed toward a large ceremonial fire that crackled outside the hut, its flames casting shadows across the village. You will be prepared, the chief said, her voice taking on a more formal cadence. Tonight we test your strength. If you are worthy, you will protect us. Ethan felt a knot of anxiety tighten in his chest. This wasn't going to be easy. He had hoped to find shelter, perhaps gain their trust gradually. Instead, it seemed he was being thrown into some kind of ritual or trial. The hours that followed were a blur. Ethan was led through the village by the woman who had first captured him. Her name, as he would later learn, was Shira. She was the tribe's fiercest warrior, tall and sinewy, with an intensity in her eyes that reminded Ethan of a jungle predator. As they walked, Shira explained the tribe's customs in a halting version of his language. It was clear she didn't trust him yet, but she wasn't openly hostile either. She described how the tribe, known as the Veshari, was an ancient people who believed in the strength of warriors above all else. They had no men in their society, at least, none that Ethan had seen, and the scarcity of males had led to strict traditions where outsiders were judged harshly. You will fight, tonight, Shira said in a clipped tone. Prove yourself, or you die. This is our way. Ethan nodded, though his thoughts raced. Fight? What exactly would he be fighting? He didn't even have any weapons, and judging by the size of the warriors around him, they were all formidable in combat. He would need more than just brute strength to survive. He would need strategy, skill, and a lot of luck. As the sun dipped below the horizon and the twin moons began to rise, the tribe gathered around the central fire. The Veshari women stood in a large circle, their faces painted with intricate designs, their eyes reflecting the flickering flames. Ethan was brought into the center of the circle, bare-chested, wearing only the basic pants and boots he'd had since the crash. The air was thick with tension, and the smell of burning herbs filled his nostrils. The chief, seated at the far end of the circle, raised her hand, and the chanting began. The women's voices rose in unison, a haunting melody that echoed through the trees. Ethan could feel the ground vibrating beneath his feet as the tribe's energy surged. From the crowd, two women stepped forward, both tall and muscular, their faces marked with the deep scars of seasoned warriors. Shira was one of them, her eyes never leaving Ethan's as she approached. The other was a woman named Kara, whom Ethan had not yet met, but whose presence alone seemed to command respect. Your trial begins now, the chief declared. You will fight, and if you are strong enough, you will serve. If you are weak, you will die. Ethan's heart pounded in his chest as Shira and Kara took their places on opposite sides of him. The tension was suffocating. He had no idea what the rules were, if there even were any. But there was one thing he understood clearly. He had to survive. The first blow came fast. Kara lunged at him with a speed that took him by surprise. Ethan barely managed to dodge her strike, her fist grazing his side as he spun away. Shira, too, moved in with predatory grace. Her fists aimed for his midsection. Ethan had no time to think, only react. His instincts kicked in, years of training as an explorer and soldier guiding his movements. But this wasn't like any fight he'd been in before. These women were warriors bred for combat, their strength almost inhuman. Ethan quickly realized that brute force wouldn't win this fight. He had to be smarter, faster. As Kara charged at him again, Ethan sidestepped, using her momentum to throw her off balance. Shira came at him from the other side, but this time, he anticipated her move, ducking low and sweeping her legs out from under her. She hit the ground hard, 
but immediately rolled to her feet, her eyes blazing with renewed determination. Ethan was exhausted already, sweat pouring down his face, but the adrenaline kept him going. He dodged, parried, and countered with every ounce of strength he had, using his agility to avoid their relentless attacks. Ethan's body was drenched in sweat, his muscles aching as he dodged another strike from Shira. The trial had been going on for what felt like hours, though it was likely only minutes. His mind raced, trying to keep up with the ferocity of the two warriors attacking him. Yet, despite their relentless assault, he found a rhythm, using their size and strength against them, leveraging his agility and quick thinking to survive. Kara charged again her powerful legs propelling her forward like a predator about to strike. Ethan narrowly dodged her spear-like thrust, using the momentum of his sidestep to counter with a swift strike to her exposed ribs. She grunted in pain but didn't slow down. Shira, in the meantime, came from the opposite side, sweeping at his legs with a vicious kick. Ethan leaped just in time, spinning him a dare to avoid the blow and land on his feet. The watching tribe members murmured in approval. Ethan wasn't winning by overwhelming his opponents. He was surviving through sheer will and adaptability, something the Veshari seemed to admire. Just when Ethan thought he might collapse from exhaustion, the chief raised her hand, signaling the end of the trial. Shira and Kara stopped their attacks instantly, stepping back and giving Ethan room to breathe. He doubled over, gasping for air, his chest heaving. The circle of women began to chant softly, a sound that reverberated through the forest. Ethan wasn't sure what it meant, but it felt significant, like the end of an important rite of passage. You have survived, the chief said, her voice cutting through the chanting. You are strong, stronger than we expected. Ethan forced himself to stand upright, his legs trembling. His mind was still racing, adrenaline coursing through his veins. Was it over? Had he passed their test? The chief rose from her seat, walking slowly toward him. As she approached, the chanting grew louder, more intense, as if the tribe was channeling their energy into this moment. She stopped before him, towering over him with a look of deep contemplation. You will serve, she said, her eyes locking onto his. You will protect us. You will be one of us. There was a finality in her words but also an acknowledgement that Ethan had earned their respect. He wasn't just a prisoner or a strange alien anymore. He was a part of the tribe. The days that followed were a whirlwind of activity. Ethan was given a small hut to sleep in, located on the outskirts of the village. It was simple, built from woven leaves and wood, but it provided shelter from the elements and a place for him to recover from the trial. His body was sore, covered in bruises from the fight, but he was alive and that was more than he could have hoped for when he first crashed on this planet. He quickly learned that the Veshari had a rigid social structure, and as the new protector, he was expected to train with the warriors and defend the tribe from any threats. Each morning, Shira would lead him through intense drills, testing his endurance and strength. She was a tough instructor, rarely offering praise, but Ethan could tell that she respected his abilities. Though they didn't speak much during training, there was an unspoken bond forming between them. Shira was fierce and disciplined, but Ethan sensed something more beneath her hardened exterior. She watched him closely, always assessing his moves, but there was a glimmer of curiosity in her eyes, a subtle acknowledgement that he was different from the rest. Outside of training, Ethan spent time with Lyra, the tribe's healer. She was a stark contrast to Shira, gentle, patient, and kind. Her touch was soft as she applied healing balms to his bruises, her fingers brushing against his skin in a way that made his heart race. Lyra had taken an immediate liking to him, offering him advice on how to navigate the complex customs of the tribe. She seemed genuinely interested in learning more about his world, asking questions about Earth and his people whenever they had a quiet moment together. You're not like the men of our legends, Lyra said one evening as they sat by the fire. The sky above them was filled with stars, unfamiliar constellations that Ethan still couldn't make sense of. But I think that might be a good thing. Ethan raised an eyebrow, glancing at her. How do you mean? Lyra smiled softly, her eyes reflecting the firelight. The men in our stories were always harsh, 
They fought for dominance, for power. But you, you fight to protect. You don't seem to crave control like they did. Ethan chuckled, though there was a serious note in his voice when he replied, I don't know about that. I'm just trying to survive. Lyra shook her head, her expression thoughtful. No, it's more than that. You care. I can see it in your eyes. Her words struck a chord in Ethan. He hadn't really thought about it before, but she was right. Despite everything he'd been through, being stranded on a strange planet, fighting for his life, he hadn't lost his sense of compassion. He wasn't just looking out for himself. Somewhere along the way, he'd started to care about these people, about their survival. The realization made him pause, his gaze drifting to the fire as he considered what that meant. Was he truly becoming part of the tribe? Could he find a place here, among these savage but honorable women? As the days turned into weeks, Ethan's bond with the tribe grew stronger. He learned their language more fluently, picking up on the nuances of their speech and customs. The other women, once wary of him, began to accept him as one of their own, treating him with a mix of respect and curiosity. Some of the younger warriors even sought him out for advice, eager to learn from his knowledge of Earth's technology and combat tactics. But it was his relationships with Shira and Lyra that deepened the most. With Shira, there was a growing tension, an unspoken challenge that hung between them whenever they trained together. She pushed him harder than anyone else, always testing his limits, but there was also a spark of something more, something neither of them could fully acknowledge yet. With Lyra, things were softer, more intimate. She showed him the delicate side of the tribe, the rituals, the healing arts, the history of their people. They spent quiet moments together, sharing stories of their worlds, and Ethan found himself drawn to her warmth and kindness. Yet, beneath it all, he couldn't shake the feeling that something bigger was coming. The peace he'd found with the tribe felt fragile as if it could be shattered at any moment. And deep in the jungle, something dangerous was stirring. The jungle was never silent. It whispered with life. Alien creatures chirped and howled, unseen but always felt. Even after weeks among the Veshari, Ethan still hadn't grown used to the strange, eerie sounds of the forest surrounding the village. Every night, he would lie awake, listening to the distant roars of beasts and the rustling of leaves as predators moved through the shadows. But this night was different. Ethan sat outside his hut, staring into the sky as the twin moons hung high above, casting long shadows across the village. His mind drifted, thinking about the relationships he had formed with Shira and Lyra, and his growing connection to the tribe. He had started to feel, at home, a strange notion given how alien everything had seemed when he first crash-landed on this planet. Suddenly, a shrill, unnatural cry pierced the night, cutting through the jungle's usual chorus. Ethan shot to his feet, his heart pounding. He wasn't the only one who noticed. Around him, the tribe stirred. Warriors grabbed their weapons, their eyes scanning the darkness. Shira emerged from the shadows, her face grim. Something's wrong, she muttered, more to herself than to Ethan. Before Ethan could ask what was happening, a second cry louder and closer, rippled through the air, followed by the sound of trees snapping, as if something massive was moving toward them. Within moments, the village erupted into chaos. Warriors barked orders in their guttural language, gathering in defensive positions. Ethan grabbed his own makeshift weapon, a spear he had been practicing with under Shira's guidance, and hurried toward her. What is it? he asked, scanning the jungle though he could see nothing through the thick vegetation. Trouble, Shira growled, her grip tightening on her weapon. It's them, the Rokhtar. Ethan frowned. Rokhtar, they are beasts, Lyra's soft voice said from behind him, though the fear in her tone was evident. A rival tribe of savages, larger than us, stronger. They raid our lands every season, seeking to destroy what we have built. Ethan's pulse quickened. He had heard whispers of these Rokhtar over the last few weeks, but he hadn't realized they posed such a serious threat. Now, as the sounds of crashing grew closer, he could hear the low, guttural growls of something far more dangerous than mere beasts. They're coming, Shira muttered, her eyes locked on the jungle, and they won't stop until we're dead. It happened so quickly, 
Ethan barely had time to react. The rock tar came charging out of the trees. Hulking, muscular creatures with thick, leathery skin and glowing yellow eyes. They towered over the Veshari. Their bodies painted with war symbols and adorned with primitive armor made from bones and animal hides. They wielded massive clubs and axes, their roars shaking the ground as they advanced. The first wave of Rattar warriors slammed into the Veshari defenses with terrifying force. Ethan found himself in the midst of the battle almost instantly, barely managing to deflect a blow from one of the creature's clubs. The sheer strength of the attack sent him stumbling backward, his arms vibrating from the impact. Ethan, watch out. Shira's voice cut through the chaos as she leaped into the fray, her spear flashing in the moonlight as she struck down one of the Rattar. The creature bellowed in pain, but even as it fell, more took its place. Ethan's instincts kicked in. He ducked under a wild swing from another Rattar, using his spear to stab at the creature's side. It wasn't enough to bring it down, but it slowed the creature just long enough for a Veshari warrior to finish it off with a well-placed strike. Around him, the village had turned into a war zone. The Rattar were relentless crashing through the Veshari defenses with brute strength, their weapons smashing through huts and setting fires as they advanced. The Veshari fought valiantly, but they were outnumbered and outmatched in sheer physical power. Ethan realized quickly that if they were going to survive this, brute force alone wouldn't win the battle. They needed strategy. The Veshari were skilled warriors, but the Rattar fought with a mindless ferocity that overwhelmed them. We need to lure them in. Ethan shouted to Shira over the din of battle. Use the village's layout against them. We can trap them between the huts. Shira glanced at him, her face a mixture of surprise and understanding. Do it, she ordered, before charging back into the fight with renewed energy. Ethan wasted no time. He began shouting instructions to the nearest warriors, directing them to fall back and create a narrow corridor between two lines of huts. As the Veshari retreated, the Rattar followed, their massive bodies crashing through the village in pursuit of their prey. Just as the last of the Veshari reached the designated position, Ethan gave the signal. Now, the warriors on the rooftops sprang into action, hurling spears and rocks down on the Rattar from above. The creatures, trapped in the narrow alley between the huts, had no room to maneuver, their size working against them as they were forced to squeeze together. The Veshari warriors on the ground, now emboldened, charged in from both sides, using the confined space to their advantage. Ethan fought alongside them, dodging blows and landing strikes where he could. The battle was brutal, but with their new strategy, the tide was turning. Rokhtar after Rokhtar fell, their massive bodies piling up as the Veshari pressed their advantage. But just when it seemed like they might gain the upper hand, a new sound cut through the air a high-pitched scream of terror. Ethan's blood ran cold. He turned, scanning the battlefield, and his heart sank when he saw it. Lyra, she had been caught in the chaos, separated from the others, and now a massive Rattar had her in its grasp, its huge hand wrapped around her waist as it prepared to strike her down. Without thinking, Ethan charged. Lyra! Time seemed to slow as he raced across the battlefield dodging bodies and weapons as he closed the distance between them. The Rattar raised its club, ready to crush Lyra in one blow. Ethan didn't hesitate. He leaped into the air, his spear aimed at the creature's back. With a grunt of effort, he drove the spear deep into the Rattar's spine. The creature roared in pain, dropping Lyra as it staggered forward. Ethan pulled the spear free and struck again, this time aiming for the back of its neck. The Rattar's roar was cut off as it collapsed to the ground with a heavy thud, its body twitching before going still. Ethan dropped to his knees beside Lyra, his breath coming in ragged gasps. She looked up at him, her face pale but uninjured, her eyes wide with shock. You, you saved me, she whispered, her voice barely audible over the sounds of the battle. Ethan nodded, still catching his breath. I told you. I'm here to protect you. The sound of the final Rattar warrior hitting the ground was followed by an eerie silence that blanketed the village. The once chaotic battlefield was now littered with bodies, both Rattar and Veshari. The fires that had raged during the battle 
were slowly dying down, casting flickering shadows across the ground. The air was thick with the smell of blood and smoke. Ethan stood beside Lyra, panting, his hands shaking as the adrenaline of the fight slowly drained from his body. His spear, slick with blood, felt heavy in his grip, and his muscles ached from the intensity of the battle. But they had done it. They had survived. Shira approached, her expression grim, but her eyes flickering with something like admiration as she looked at Ethan. Her armor was splattered with blood, both hers and the Rotars, but she moved with the steady confidence of a warrior who had faced death and come out victorious. You fought well, Shira said, her voice low but firm. We would not have survived without your help. Ethan nodded, wiping the sweat from his brow. We worked together. The strategy was what made the difference. Shira's lips twitched slightly, as if she wanted to argue. But instead, she simply inclined her head. Perhaps, but you've proven yourself tonight, human. Lyra, still shaken from her near-death experience, placed a hand on Ethan's arm, her eyes full of gratitude. You saved me, she whispered, her voice trembling. I, I don't know how to thank you. Ethan gave her a small smile, though his mind was still racing from the battle. You don't have to thank me. We're in this together. The surviving Veshari gathered around the fallen Raktar, checking to see if any of their enemies remained alive. One by one, the Veshari warriors, battered and bruised but standing, began to chant in their low, guttural tones. The chant was rhythmic, primal, echoing through the trees as they honored their fallen comrades and celebrated their hard-won victory. The chief, tall and imposing as ever, emerged from the crowd. She stood before Ethan, her eyes scanning the battlefield, taking in the destruction around them. When her gaze finally settled on him, there was a sense of approval in her stern expression. You have done more than survive, the chief said, her voice carrying a weight of authority. You have protected us. You are no longer an outsider. You are one of us now. Ethan's heart pounded in his chest. He had fought alongside these women, bled with them, and now, after what felt like a lifetime, he was being fully accepted into their tribe. The chief raised her hands, and the chanting quieted. The women gathered in a circle around Ethan, their eyes on him, as if waiting for something. He felt a knot form in his stomach. He wasn't sure what this next step would entail. You will take on a new role, the chief continued, her voice firm and clear. You will be our protector, our leader in battle, and more. You have earned the right to be our mate. Ethan blinked, unsure if he had heard her correctly. Mate, Shira stepped forward, her intense gaze fixed on him. It is our way. The strongest male must help us survive, not just by fighting but by ensuring our future. Ethan swallowed hard. He had known that the Veshari had different customs, but this. This was beyond anything he had expected. The idea of being seen as their protector and mate, of being responsible for the tribe's survival in such a primal, intimate way, sent a jolt through him. Lyra's hand on his arm tightened slightly, and when he glanced at her, he saw both fear and hope in her eyes. She wasn't demanding anything from him, but it was clear that she wanted him to choose her to acknowledge the bond they had begun to form. Shira, on the other hand, stood tall and defiant. There was no question in her mind. She had earned her place at his side in battle, and she expected to be his partner in all things. Ethan took a deep breath, his mind spinning. He had been thrust into this world with no warning, forced to adapt to a society that was so different from anything he had known. And now, he was expected to fulfill a role that carried both honor and immense responsibility. The chief's voice broke the silence. You may choose who will stand with you. We are not like the others. You may have one, or more, if it pleases you. The survival of the tribe is what matters most. Ethan's mind raced. He had spent time with both Shira and Lyra, one fierce, the other gentle, and both had touched his life in different ways. His connection with Lyra was tender, born of mutual understanding and care. Shira, though rough around the edges, had fought alongside him and earned his respect as a warrior. But this wasn't just about romance. It was about the tribe's future, about survival in a savage world where strength, unity, and trust were everything. He looked at Shira, 
then at Lyra, and finally the entire tribe. The weight of their expectation pressed down on him, and yet there was something liberating about the choice he was being given. He wasn't just an outsider anymore. He had earned their respect and now had the power to shape their future. I will stand with you, Ethan said, his voice steady as he turned to face both Shira and Lyra. Both of you, together, we will protect this tribe and ensure its future. The chief smiled, her expression approving. It is decided. The chanting resumed, louder this time, echoing through the village as Ethan stood between Shira and Lyra, their hands in his. The weight of his new role settled over him, but instead of fear, he felt a strange sense of peace. He wasn't alone anymore. The night air was warm, and the embers of the ceremonial fire crackled softly as the chanting of the tribe faded into the background. Ethan stood with Shira and Lyra, their hands entwined with his. The weight of the decision he had made still heavy on his mind. Yet, instead of the uncertainty he had felt earlier, a strange sense of acceptance had settled over him. The village had begun to return to some semblance of normalcy after the brutal battle with the Rokhtar. Warriors tended to the wounded, fires were put out, and the dead were honored with solemn rituals. Despite the destruction and loss, there was a feeling of relief in the air. The tribe had survived, and with Ethan's help, they had won. Later that night, as the village quieted and the stars twinkled above, Ethan sat outside his hut with Shira and Lyra beside him. The firelight danced across their faces, and for the first time in what felt like ages, he allowed himself to relax. Lyra leaned her head on his shoulder, her soft touch a comforting contrast to the harsh world around them. I didn't think we would survive, she admitted, her voice barely above a whisper. When I was caught by that Rokhtar, I thought it was over. Ethan looked down at her, his heart aching at the memory of that terrifying moment. I wouldn't have let that happen, he said softly, his arm wrapping around her. I'm here to protect you, all of you. Shira, sitting on his other side, was quieter than usual, her gaze fixed on the flickering flames. She hadn't said much since the battle ended, but her presence was grounding. There was a different energy between them now, a bond that had been forged in combat, in survival. They were no longer just training partners or comrades. They were equals in every sense. You fought like one of us today, Shira finally said, her voice low but carrying a weight of emotion that surprised Ethan. I didn't think a human could, could fight like that. You earned your place here. Ethan nodded, feeling the tension in her words. He had sensed it during their training, her uncertainty about him, her doubts. But now, after the battle, it was clear that Shira's respect for him had deepened, transforming into something more. I'm not from your world, Ethan replied, his voice steady. But I've come to care about this tribe, about both of you. We've been through so much together, and I don't plan on leaving. Shira's sharp eyes softened for a moment, and she reached out placing a hand on his knee. It was a small gesture, but for Shira, it spoke volumes. Then we fight together, for the tribe, for each other. Lyra smiled gently, her fingers brushing over Ethan's arm. We're stronger together. The words hung in the air, and Ethan knew they weren't just about battle. They were about everything. The life they had now, the bonds they had formed, and the future they would build together. As the days passed, Ethan's place within the tribe solidified. He trained with the warriors every morning, not just as a student anymore, but as one of them. His strategies, his agility, and his understanding of the Rokhtar's tactics had earned him a reputation among the tribe as a leader, someone to be trusted and followed. He and Shira worked closely, developing new techniques to prepare for any future threats, while Lyra continued her healing work keeping the tribe healthy and strong. The Veshari treated him not as an outsider, but as one of their own, a protector, a mate, and a part of their future. Ethan found himself deeply involved in the tribe's daily life, contributing to their survival not just through combat, but by sharing his knowledge of technology, agriculture, and medicine. It was a strange blend of his human upbringing and the Veshari's primal way of life, but it worked. Together, they were building something new. The relationship between Ethan, Shira, 
and Lyra grew stronger as well. The initial awkwardness of their arrangement had faded, replaced by mutual respect and affection. Shira's fierce passion was balanced by Lyra's gentle warmth, and Ethan found himself drawn to both women in different ways. It was unconventional by human standards, but here, in the world of the Veshari, it felt right. One evening, as the tribe gathered for a small celebration, honoring the renewal of their strength after the battle, Ethan stood at the edge of the village, looking out into the dark jungle. The stars above shimmered brightly, and the sounds of the Veshari's music filled the air. Shira approached him quietly, her presence as commanding as ever. She stood beside him, her gaze also fixed on the jungle. You're thinking about Earth, she said, not as a question, but as a statement. Ethan smiled faintly, maybe a little. It feels like a lifetime ago. Shira was silent for a moment before she turned to him, her eyes intense. Do you miss it? You're home. Ethan considered her question, thinking about the life he had left behind, his family, his friends, the world he knew. But then he thought about what he had gained here, the sense of belonging, the connections he had made, and the tribe that now depended on him. I think, Ethan said, turning to face her, I found a new home here. Shira's lips quirked into the slightest smile before she nodded in approval. Good. As the night deepened and the fire burned brightly in the village, Ethan knew that, for the first time in a long while, he was exactly where he was meant to be.